Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Drillinger, and I'm the chairman of the Ten Mulliver Scout Museum. The museum is offering this series of, uh, of talks, and because of the pandemic, the talks are virtual. And we're really happy that you could all be here to participate in this program this evening. Um, the Ten Mile River Scout Museum is located at the headquarters area of the Ten Mile River Scout Camps, which is located in Narrowsburg, New York. Ten Mile River Scout Camp is a 12,000 acre reservation. The camps opened in 1927 and were made possible largely by the work of prominent New Yorkers led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The Ten Mile River Scout Museum was started in 1997 and is dedicated to preserving the history and artifacts of the Ten Mile River Scout camps and the local area. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, the museum is currently closed. Otherwise, we normally would have been open seven days a week during the summer. But you can take a virtual tour of the museum by going to the museum's website, tmrmuseum.org slash historian. And if you have any questions, feel free to call the museum at this number. We are using the platform GoToWebinar to present this series. And somewhere on your screen will probably be a control panel that looks something like this. During the presentation, you might have a question and feel free to type your question into the question section. And our presenter will try to answer as many questions as we can get to at the end of the presentation. Also at the end of the program, there'll be a brief survey. So we would appreciate it if you would stick around and take the survey. A video of this complete program will be available on YouTube on our TMR YouTube channel in about three days. Here are some of the ways that you can interact with the museum online. As I mentioned, there's the museum's website. We also have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. And as I said just a moment ago, we have a YouTube channel, search for 10 Mile River Scout Museum. And you can also look for the virtual tour as well as this program. Again, feel free to call the museum at any time and leave a message if no one is there to pick up. Or if you have a question, you can email the museum at questions at tmrmuseum.org. And you can email me at chairman at tmrmuseum.org. We offer these programs free of charge to anyone who wants to participate, but the museum does incur some cost in producing these programs. And if you're so motivated to support this, please visit tmrmuseum.org slash donate and make a contribution if you feel like it. Tonight, we are happy to present a discussion about bats in the Upper Delaware River Valley and our presenter will be Erica Spies. Erica has been working seasonally for the National Park Service at the Upper Delaware Scenic and Recreational River as a biological science technician and natural resources ranger. She's been doing this for the past four years. She assists with invasive species monitoring and removal, water quality sampling, American shad and trout survey efforts, dragonfly mercury project sampling, monitoring of bat activity, and much more. She is also a graduate student at East Stroudsburg University, researching potential little brown bat fall migration movements via modus tracking and post white nose syndrome bat community changes within the park corridor. She grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago, where she received her associates in biology. She then went on to graduate from Colorado State University with a degree in fish, wildlife, and conservation biology, with a, con with a concentration in conservation. Prior to working for the National Park Service, Erica worked for USGS in Colorado, researching macroinvertebrates and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Oregon studying endangered Lost River and short-nose suckers, and in Alaska working on a remote salmon weir. She absolutely loves the outdoors and working with wildlife, and it's our great pleasure to present 
Erica speaks. Erica, you seem to be muted. Oh, <laughs> I see that now. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, as Michael had said, that I work for the National Park Service at the Upper Delaware Scenic and Recreational River, and I'm going to be talking about bats. I am going to turn my camera off just to save my bandwidth. Um, my Wi-Fi is not the best, so fingers crossed we don't get any interruptions. All right. So let's get to it. Bats of the Upper Delaware River Valley. So where in the world is the Upper Delaware Scenic and Recreational River? Well, here at the park, we like to call it UPD for short. And this is a picture of the mouth of the 10 Mile River that flows into the Delaware River. And the 10 Mile River flows to the Boy Scout camp. And it's beautiful. So the Delaware River itself is unique in that it is the longest undammed river east of the Mississippi, and it provides drinking water to 13 million people. That's about 5% of the U.S. population. So Updee begins just below Hancock, New York, and in our park, we have 73.4 river miles. And our river corridor extends 0.25 miles on each side of the river for a total of 55,575.5 acres. And out of all of that, NPS only owns 30.4 acres. But don't worry, there's a lot of undeveloped forest in our area that provides habitat for a lot of unique wildlife. And it is also the border between New York and Pennsylvania. We have New York here on the upper right and Pennsylvania on the lower left. It runs through Delaware, Orange and Sullivan County in New York and Pike and Wayne County in Pennsylvania. And right now we are taking an aerial tour and we are at the end of the park here that ends just below Mill Rift, Pennsylvania and above Sparrow Bush, New York at this railroad bridge. All right, so bats of New York and Pennsylvania. I'm gonna give you a brief um, little biology review here. So we classify organisms by different groupings and we get more specific as we go to species. So we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, and genus. Oh, I'm on the wrong slide here, I'm so sorry. And um, we're gonna start with the order. So we have Chiroptera is the order, which means Chiroptera means hand wing. And as you can see here on the right, we have the digits or the fingers, and it is covered with skin that makes the wing. We also have a suborder, which is Microchiroptera, also known as microbats. These are smaller bats. Fruit bats are megabats. We don't have those here. The family that we have here in the Eastern US is Vespertilianidae, and all of these bats are nocturnal and insectivores, and they echolocate. So that means they eat insects and come out at night and use echolocation as a backup to navigate. And we have nine species present in New York and Pennsylvania. So I'm just gonna go back there. I didn't realize I had skipped ahead. Um, this slide is, based on the mammal badge requirements. I just wanted to put that out there that bats are mammals and mammals have certain criteria and characteristics that we all share. These are not all of them, but here are a select few. So mammals have hair or fur, mammary glands. So that means that female bats feed their pups milk, not insects. We have four chambered hearts, endothermy, which means we're warm blooded. We have specialized teeth that include incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, and we have three inner ear bones, the incus, malleus, and stapes. All right, 
So let's get back to the bats we have in our area. We have tree bats. We have three different species here in New York and Pennsylvania. We have the hoary bat, eastern red bat, and silver-haired bat. And as you can guess, they like to live in trees. They tend to roost in the leaves, in hollow holes of trees, and even under bark. Most of these bats will migrate south and they will go there during the winter. But some of them don't read the bat book that we have written about them, and some do tend to hibernate in caves. Speaking of caves, we have cave bats. We have the tricolored bats, big brown bats, and we have myotis genus here with the Indiana bats, little brown, eastern small-footed, and northern long-eared. So as you guessed it, these guys will hibernate in caves. And where they tend to hibernate is known as a hibernacula. The northern long-eared and tricolored and little brown bat were state listed in Pennsylvania in 2019. The northern long-eared and Indiana bat are federally listed. So bats have the ability to echolocate. Most bats emit sound out of their mouth but some are nasal emitters. Our bats here in the east are nasal, are, are oral emitters. So they will send out sounds from their mouth. These high frequency pulses of sound are above human hearing, which are known as ultrasonic sounds. Humans can only hear up to 20 kilohertz and bats typically um, project their sound above 20 up to 120 kilohertz. Some bats are below 20 and people can actually hear them. When a bat is searching for food, it will emit 10 to 50 calls per second. And that is the search phase here. And when a bat approaches an insect, it will emit more call pulses. And that is the next step here. After search, we're in the approach phase. They do have two different call types. They have constant frequency, which gives the bat information about the insect size, speed, and flight pattern. So once it picks up, it will increase, and then they can change to a different type, which is called frequency modulated calls. These can be shallow or they can be steep, and this will tell the bat the texture and shape of an object. So it's pretty remarkable that they can use echolocation to really build a picture of what's in front of them. And this is known as a feeding buzz when we have a combination of a search and approach phase. And this is when they're in the terminal phase is a steep frequency calls and they're very, very, very rapid. So as you can see here, the bat is emitting their echolocation calls and the sound waves are bouncing back to build that picture in the bat's brain. And this is just a quick little demo of a bat emitting some calls and a bat catching its dinner. This is how most of our bats feed here in the east. They will feed during flight. All right, I have some batty facts for you guys. Bats are the only mammals that truly fly. I know we have flying squirrels out here, and even though flying is in their name, they glide. Second largest order of mammals is bats. So every one in five mammal species is a bat, and they are second to rodents. Rodents is the largest order of mammals, but do not get confused. Bats are not flying rats. They are more related to humans and primates than they are rodents. There are over 1,400 species of bats, so this is a very diverse group of mammals. Bats can actually see perfectly fine. They do have very well um, developed vision, and they use the echolocation because they are nocturnal. Some bats, such as the fruit bat, actually relies on sight and doesn't echolocate. Most bats do not have rabies. Research indicates that cases of rabies in bat populations is less than 0.5% in most areas. Even on the CDC website, there is contradicting information if you go to look up stuff about bats and rabies. And there is a lot of misinformation out there, 
but again, rabies is nothing to mess with. So if you ever do see a bat or any wildlife for that matter of fact, all mammals do carry rabies. Always use caution around wildlife. Never handle a bat barehanded. And if you do get bitten or scratched, you should seek medical assistance immediately. Depending on the species, bats can live for a very long time. Little brown bats are known to live up to 34 years in the wild. And most species of bats in our area only have one pup per year. Big brown and hoary bats have two pups, while the eastern red pat can have four to five. Bats are extremely important. They control pest insects, and they actually have an economic value to US alone agriculture, and that is estimated to be 3.7 to $53 billion per year. One study in Indiana shows that 150 big brown bats estimated to eat 1.3 million pest insects in one year. And our little brown can catch over a thousand insects in just one night. They do eat mosquitoes that carry diseases and also help maintain the food security of agricultural crops. Tropical and subtropical bats assist with seed dispersal and pollination. So a lot of these tropical and subtropical bats will feed on nectar and that will allow them to pollinate plants. There are 500 plant species that rely on bats to pollinate them. This includes eucalyptus, mango, banana, cacao, which is chocolate, guava, and agave. So the next time you eat some chocolate or if you're of age, drink some tequila, just remember you wouldn't have that without bats. So guano is rich in nutrients. Guano is their poop and it can provide ecosystems to bacteria and insects and actually be used in fertilizer. There are fertilizers that do have guano. Bat flight inspires research into more efficient energy drones. Um, I actually was reading about this recently and if you want to read more into it, Google bat bot. It is a little creepy, but bat flight is very, very efficient and um, you know, they made it so the drones could be quiet and fly with more precision. So vampire bats, like mosquitoes, have chemicals in their saliva that are anti-clotting so that they can feed on blood. But don't worry, vampire bats are not here. They are in Central and South America, and they rarely feed on humans. They primar primarily feed on cattle, chicken, and pigs and the compounds from their saliva has contributed to anticoagulant drugs, and these drugs actually have helped a lot of stroke patients. So threats to bats, there are quite a few. So as I mentioned, they have long lifespans, like the little brown can live up to 34 years, um, but they have low reproductive rates, so they only give birth to one pup a year. So it takes them a really long time to build up their populations. Um, and so a lot of them have been devastated by different threats and it does take a while for them to rebuild. The spread of misinformation, especially now um, in the time of COVID, there is a lot of misinformation being spread. And back in the day, a lot of people were afraid of bats um, due to misinformation, thinking, oh, they'll nest in my hair. Bats don't nest, they roost, and they would very much rather avoid you than get near you. Um, and you're not gonna turn into a vampire if you get bit by a bat, but if you do get bit, you should seek medical assistance. Um, many of our bat species are already in decline due to habitat loss. Bats have moved from natural roost um, and they started exploiting human developments such as caves, tunnels, bridges, and other buildings. And um, destruction of hibernacula. So hibernacula is where they go to hibernate for the winter. Destruction can be from completely sealing caves, um, starting quarrying, 
caves collapsing, mine collapsing, or even reopening these areas for mining again. Um, flooding can also cause destruction and disturbance in hibernacula. Um, disturbance is typically caused by people that would go into the caves during the winter when bats are hibernating. And we really don't know very much about population sizes for most bat species in general, just because they're so cryptic, they're small, and they're nocturnal. And we really don't know much about tree bats because they're pretty difficult to find. So white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is caused by the invasive cold loving fungus, Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which is a pretty relevant name with the destructins at the end and is known as PD for short. This attacks the muzzle as well as the wings of bats. As we can see here on the right, there is white on the nose, hence the name white nose. There is also white on any skin that is exposed here. This causes physiological disruptions in hibernating bats. So when bats are in a state of torpor, where they um, minimize their energy consumption towards um, just basically staying alive. Um, they lower their metabolic rate, their heart rate, and their respiratory rate, and rely on fat reserves to survive during this state of torpor or hibernating. Um, so when the white nose fungus starts to grow on their skin, this annoys them and it arouses them to wake up. And when they wake up, they go to groom themselves, they go to find insects. Unfortunately, it's usually pretty cold, it's the dead of the winter and there are no insects. And they do lose some of that fat reserve that was meant for them to be surviving throughout the winter. It is estimated that over 6.7 million bats have died since it was discovered in 2006. It was discovered near Albany, New York, so not super far from our area. And sadly, this picture here of the scientists with the bats, those are all bats that had um, suffered from white nose and didn't make it. Currently, white nose is spreading throughout the United States and Canada, and there is no cure at the moment, but there is a lot of research and a lot of treatment going on right now. They even go into caves and spray um, fungicides while the bats are not present. There is UV lights that they try to use um, to kill the fungus as well. And PD lives in the soils, and we'll see why that is an issue in a second here. And now white nose is spread fairly quickly because a lot of bats will congregate and huddle together during hibernation, which transfers the fungus. And this impacts half of the 47 bat species we have here in the US and in Canada that hibernate in the winter. So it typically impacts hibernating cave bats. And it came from Europe and we found that out tracing it back using DNA samples. Okay, so here in the circle, we see that as the start, and as it gets to red is more recent. So we see the spread happening since 2006, um, and this stops in 2009. We have positive cases in 35 states and seven Canadian provinces, and it has been found in four states, California, Mississippi, Montana, and Wyoming as presence only, no positive cases yet. And it is spread in the soil, so we do believe that the spread has been unfortunately and unintentionally caused by cavers that didn't clean their gear and then went to other caves. So this is a summarization of data from a study in 2011 where they went into hibernaculas and had counts um, pre-white nose and then post-white nose. These surveys were conducted in New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Virginia, and West Virginia. And as we can see here, little brown bats and northern long-eared bats have been really impacted. A lot of our myota species in general have been impacted by white nose, along with the tricolored bat. The big brown bat hasn't been as impacted, 
Um, there are a few theories as to why this happened. Um, big brown bats generally are larger bats than all the rest, and they don't hibernate as far into the cave. And the further you go into a cave, the colder it gets, and PD likes the cold, so you get the idea. Those are just theories. There is um, research ongoing as to why big brown bats are not as impacted. White nose syndrome was found in Sullivan County, New York in the winter of 2007 into 2008. Um, so it is in our area. We don't, uh, I personally don't know if a lot of our bats have the disease. I don't think we've tested too, too many, um, but it is present in the park. Another impact are wind turbines. It is estimated that over 600,000 to 880,000 bats were killed in 2012 alone. This typically impacts migratory tree bats. And to get a real estimate of how many bats are um, fallen casualties to wind turbines is very difficult because their carcasses are spread and um, scavenger species will go and feed on them. So mortality is caused from direct collision with the blades itself and also internal hemorrhaging, which is caused by barotrauma. Barotrauma is when a bat goes near the tips of the blade that have low pressure and the air in the lungs and blood vessels will then rapidly expand, resulting in the hemorrhaging. So a promising approach to reducing bat mortality is curtailment and feathering of turb turbine blades at low wind speeds. So wind curtailment is when the output of the wind plants is reduced to a level below its maximum generation capacity. And feathering is turning the blades parallel to the wind so the turbines do not rotate. This results in slowing or stopping of the blades when wind speeds are minimal. Wind farms are an excellent source of green energy. They just really need to develop um, something that is more bat friendly and bird friendly. And they are working on ways to do that with the ways that I just mentioned. And there are other resources that they're looking into um, making a ver vertical um, turbine that doesn't actually have blades that are um, out in the air. So how do we survey for bats in the upper Delaware? Well, one technique that we have used in the past is mist netting. This is hands-on and it gives us a direct population number of species and we can identify them in the hand. We can tell um, the age of a bat if it's a juvenile, which is under one year, by looking at the finger joints. Um, they're not fully formed at this point, so we can tell if it's a juvenile or an adult. Past that, it's a little difficult to age, direct age number. Um, so as you can see, it is difficult to see through this net here. So it is a fine um, mist net that we place between two poles. This is actually what ornithologists use um, to capture birds. So the bats that don't echolocate around the nets will become tangled and the bat biologists wearing their gloves will quickly untangle the bat and measurements and other details such as species identification will be taken and um, we can even test them for white nose this way with a cotton swab. So another technique is stationary acoustics. This is less disruptive and it doesn't require any handling of bats. So it's becoming a very popular method, um, especially with white nose being so prevalent. These detectors will pick up bat calls and record them for later processing. So they convert those ultrasonic calls that we can't hear into something audible that we can hear. And this will give us an index of bat activity and so we can see if a species is presence or absence in a certain area and it'll also give us an idea of what species are foraging in what types of habitat that we have here at the park. You cannot get a population size number from this type of survey technique because 
a bat can simply just be flying back and forth, back and forth um, through the detector area and can be picked up multiple times. So we do the index of activity instead. So active surveying is when you're with the equipment and you um, are more involved with the process. And that's how we use our Air 125s here. This is in Berryville and this is in Equinox. And it is connected here to a little laptop that runs a program that I will go into more detail about in the next couple slides. So active is when you stay with the equipment while it is recording. And these are our AIR 125 setups. Now passive is when you can leave the equipment out for multiple nights. And that's what the Pedersen D500X is for. All of the calls are recorded on this device here. And as you can see, it can be pretty hidden in a tree um, and it can record for multiple nights. So I do have a video here to kind of explain the stationary setup using an AR-125. This is what I'm doing for my thesis research now because um, I cannot handle bats um, this year due to COVID. And it will give me an index of bad activity and I'll be able to compare that with pre white nose activity that we would that we can um, sorry that we had collected in 2008 and 2009. Hi there Eric here with the National Park Service. We are on the upper Delaware at the 10 mile river access. We had a tropical storm come through yesterday, so we do have a bit of debris on the ground and the river's up really high. But we have our stationary acoustic set up because the bats are going to be out to eat tonight. So we have our Air 125 hooked up to our laptop here and it's running Spectre. What Spectre does is it will take the bat calls and translate them into something that we can see and hear. So let's see if we can get any bats. And we have one right now. Yeah, the 10 mile river access is a pretty active area. I think we had bad activity pretty much the entire night. So if you do want to see a bat from a safe distance flying around, um, the 10 mile river access is a great place to go around dusk. And the video is pretty dark because we do our surveying during the night because that's when bats are active. So here I have more of what we do once we get that data and how we process it and identify two species. Okay, so from those wave files we got in Spectre, we can put that into different programs. Um, the program that we typically use in the park is Sonabat. And the first thing you want to do is scrub all of your files for noise. Noise is anything that is not a back call. We do pick up insects, birds, other mammals, and if you're doing a transect, it can be from your car or a train passing. So once that we have scrubbed them, we can put them in here and look at them. The first thing that I look for is the characteristic frequency, also known as FC. That's the frequency of a call pulse at its flattest point where the slope is closest to horizontal. So right here, we have a really great designation of our characteristic frequency, which is around 30. So anything that is below 30 is a low frequency bat. From 30 to 40 is mid frequency and above 40 is a high frequency. So we can already kind of narrow down our list and say it's definitely not myotis. Myotis is a high frequency bat. And we will look at the shape and also the duration. And looking at that and seeing that it goes above 60 kilohertz here, I would say that this is a big brown bat. So let's hit classify and yep, eight for eight. We are on the big brown bat route here. So I'm going to play you guys um, what the real sound sounds like. Again, this is above what we can hear. So keep that in mind. You won't hear this if you're standing outside. But here is what a bat call sounds like. I'll play that one more time. Okay, now this is time expanded. So this is slowed down a bit and drawn out so that we can hear it in a different way.
So as you can hear, it kind of sounds almost similar to a bird. So the way that you can actually batch your calls, what we just did was a manual vet, um, is in Sonabat, it has a program called Sonic Batch. So you upload all your WAV files into that and based on certain algorithms and criteria of a call. Oh, uh oh, what happened there? Call library based on region, and our region is NA, PA, and West Virginia. It'll match up your calls with calls that are in that library. And how they build that library is they caught bats and identified them as species in hand and released them and recorded all the sounds that they made. And so it kind of matches up with your, your files and you can identify your bat species that way. So now when I clicked the classify button and it said um, EPFU, that is actually what um, is the big brown scientific name. It's Epticicus fuscus. So it is the first two names, uh, two letters of the genus EP, and then the last, uh, the first two of the species name. So EPFU, EPFU. Some people can actually hear bat chatter. This is typically when they're about to emerge, they'll start talking to each other, and I can hear it. Most people can. It's pretty interesting. So a technique that we have um, is acoustic driven transects. So this method was first developed in Europe. This monitoring allows us to get an idea of spatial distribution on a very large scale, and we can document population trends. So we have our AR125 hooked up to a window clamp, and then it is connected to a laptop. This will start about 30 minutes after sunset. So we do start when it is fairly starting to get a bit dark. And we drive 20 miles per hour on a predetermined route. We have two different routes here in the park. We have a regular transect route and a mini transect route. The regular route is 45.4 miles and the mini is 21.2. The longer ones usually take about three to four hours to complete. We do see a lot of wildlife while we're doing this. It doesn't go throughout the entire river corridor, but it does um, go throughout quite a bit of it. We have the red one here is the regular, and the yellow one here is the mini, and we will start either on the south or north end, and the next night we will alternate. Um, we do this because bats do emerge at different times, and we want to make sure that we are capturing all the bat activity that we can, and that's why we included a mini transect as well. So this here is our data from 2019. We also did transects in 2020. We just haven't gotten to processing it yet. So we have four of the mini transects and 12 of the regular. Again, this is just an indices of bad activity, not population sizes. And we can see that big browns pretty much dominate the activity here in the park along the transect route and then followed by the eastern red bat. And um, surprisingly, we do have a decent amount of little brown and myotis calls along our transects. So little browns were the most dominant species in the eastern U.S. before white nose syndrome, and a lot of areas are starting to see a shift to more big brown activity. So little brown and Indiana bats are clumped together here. Um, it's because they have very similar call characteristics and they're pretty difficult to identify. So we just lump them together in this um, case here. So this is our um, spatial distribution of little brown and Indiana bats and all myotis species on our regular longer transect. And again, this is just the data that was shown here in that previous chart. 
and um, we do have a decent amount. So that is a good thing for the Upper Delaware. Again, um, just because some bats weren't noted along our transect route doesn't mean that they aren't in the park. Um, you know, we didn't pick up silver haired bats on this one here, but it could just be that they're not along the route that we were driving. And this is our mini transect data. And I just wanna point out a really cool thing that I noticed when I was making these maps. Um, our route and the river corridor make a little bat shape. And I absolutely love that. <laughs> So again, we have a pretty decent amount of myota species, which are the ones that are um, a main concern for a lot of studies just because they've been so impacted by white nose. So another surveying techniques are emergence counts. We follow the Pennsylvania Game Commission's Appalachian Bat Count Protocol, which is something that you can actually apply if you know of a local roost yourself. Um, I did provide a link here, but if you just Google Game Commission Appalachian Bat Count, you can find this information all on your own. So we do summer maternity roost surveys. A maternity roost is a location where female bats go to give birth and raise their young. So this will tell us trends in summer bat colonies and it helps determine surviving colony locations and um, the trends post white nose. So it's very important that these surveys are conducted. We compare pre and post volant. So volant means when pups are flying, the numbers to see how the population has grown. And for little brown bats, they give birth to one pup in late May or early June, and they become volant about four weeks later, so early to mid-July. Now, big brown bats will also give birth to, um, they'll give birth to two pups instead of one, typically, in June, and they will also become volant three to four weeks later, so typically in early to mid-July as well. The reason I'm mentioning little brown and um, big brown bats is because these are the ones that typically roost in buildings. So why do they roost in buildings? I had mentioned it a little earlier. Um, historically, they used to roost in hollow trees, but today bats use buildings because loss of habitats. And what we do, we go to these buildings and we'll stand and try to um, locate the areas where they are coming out and emerging. And we will Focus on one area, we'll have multiple people standing around the building holding a clicker and you literally just click, click each time you see a bat come out of the building. We start this around dusk and we go until we cannot see anymore. And they have plenty of food in the upper Delaware because I definitely get eaten alive by the mosquitoes here every time I do a bat count. So what can you do to help bats? You can support natural habitats. If you have old trees on your property and they don't pose a risk, you can leave them and a bat might be able to use that as a home. Avoid use of pesticides. You know, um, bats eat insects and using pesticides will kill their food. Or if the insect didn't fully die and it is flying around with some pesticides traces on it, a bat can eat that and then um, the pesticide loading will transfer to the bat. You can install bat boxes and this will provide additional roost. We installed these bat boxes here in 2018 and we just had our first bat this summer go into the box. Um, I, I will provide a link with more information. And you can become a citizen scientist. Like I said, um, doing the Appalachian bat count, that really helps us out with uh, summer maternity trends. Um, you can also try to find out and see if something's going on in your area that you can do to help bats. Do not disturb bats. So if you do know of active roosts, just leave them alone. You know, you can go and watch them emerge, but you don't want to get too close. You don't want to go in that space where they are actually roosting. And you also want to stay out of caves and mines where they're hibernating in the winter because you can also wake them up just as White Nose does and they can use up those fat reserves. I do not like glue traps. I would say do not use glue traps. They are inhumane and they do not just catch mice or whatever you're trying to catch. They do tend to catch bats as well. 
Um, spotted lanternfly is a new invasive here in Pennsylvania that we are trying to combat and is spreading rapidly. It does impact a lot of um, crop trees that we have um, and hops and grapevines and it's just an overall nasty bug. I recommend you look more into it um, but a lot of people are putting sticky traps around on their trees and especially trees of heaven and unfortunately this does catch other insects that are beneficial, birds and bats. I will provide a link that um, we will have on the next slide that you can actually build your own wildlife proof um, trap. And I built one yesterday with my intern and it wasn't too difficult after you get the hang of it. And hey, if it can save wildlife, then I'm all for it. And we're hoping to put these up at the 10 mile river access at some tree of heaven that is located there. So another recommendation is use humane methods to exclude or remove bats from buildings. I will also provide a link with more information. Um, a lot of bat biologists will recommend you use a vent that is a one-way vent so the bats can get out and they can't get back in. Um, bats that are roosting typically tend to go um, and leave in November and they go to their hibernation areas. So this is a good time for you to go up there and see where are these little areas that the bats can get in at. So if you find a bat, you should call your local wildlife rehabilitator. Do not bring a bat into your house. Um, they will tell you more information about what processes they'll do and hopefully they can come pick it up. So I recommend keeping your cats inside when possible. Um, cats will, you know, eat mice and birds, but they also can eat bats. They are the one of the most common causes of bat casualties. So public outreach and education, you guys now know how amazing bats are and you can spread the word and tell your friends and, you know, try to maybe um, dispel some of the myths that have been going around about bats. So here are the links that I was talking about, PA bat count, more information about white nose syndrome. This is a great link here for bat box installation, the wildlife safe um, spotted lantern fly traps, what to do if you get a bat in your home or if it's roosting in your home, and how to clean your gear if you go caving. This is a really important thing to um, read up on. And I provided a link for our UPDI Facebook page, and I included PA Bat Rescue. They have a lot of great information about what happens when they rescue bats and um, what to do if you find a bat or have a bat in your house. So that is the end of my talk, and I will open it up for any questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Erica. This is Mitchell. I'm the vice chair of the museum. And thank you so much for this talk. It was great. So many people said you're so thorough that they couldn't even think of questions. So <laughs> maybe you actually stopped Harley Quinn, but we'll see. On a more <laughs> serious note, we do have a few. So let's jump into it. Um, one, do bats have natural animal enemies? And I guess just to tag that in, we talked at the end about cats eating um, rodents and things. I know owls are supposed to eat um, rodents. How do bats get along with owls? And so I guess we'll tag that together. Yeah, so um, uh, owls will, they can eat bats, um, but if there is enough food for both of them, I think that, you know, they can coexist. And um, there's one theory that bats will avoid full moons because they're more visible to owls and um, other animals that might be looking to prey upon them. Um, but yeah, I, I do think, you know, they tend to likely coexist, but if an owl is hungry, it may may uh, go after a bat. Jessica, do you have anything to add? I have Jessica Newburn here, who is a biologist at the Park Service. Um, she's here to assist me with any questions that um, I might not be able to get to, because she's been studying bats for much longer than me. I mean, you're, you nailed it. it they, it's the same reason that when they do fly around trees that they stick to trees and they don't usually fly out in the open. 
if they can avoid it because they can be predated upon by owls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then a bunch of other questions. Let's jump into it again. Um, okay. Um, do bats walk on the ground or do they just fly? So vampire bats will actually are the only ones that do crawl on the ground. Bats are capable of crawling on the ground, but typically they do. They would rather fly. They're, they're built for flying. Um, they roost upside down. And one theory of that is that their pelvic girdle is not as developed. So, you know, they don't really have big um, hind legs. So crawling is not um, something that's too typical of the bats in our area. Great, and next couple of questions, let's jump into it. Are there any bats dangerous to humans? Um, so this goes along with some of the myths that we have. Um, bats don't go and seek out humans and try to attack them in any way. Um, as I said, they would rather avoid you. They're mostly out trying to get their food. They're so beneficial to humans that I think more than um, anything that they're just here to help us out. Cool. Um, does NPS have any maps of local bat hibernacula, and are there specific colonies locally that we should be aware of? And I believe this question is coming from somebody in the area of Ten Mile River. Okay. Um, we don't know where they go um, to hibernate. That was going to be part of a research project that I was going to be involved with using MODIS to track the bats. We don't know much about migration movements in general. We do know of um, a few hibernacula that would be within range um, that the bats could migrate to. They don't go super, super far. Um, it's under like 500 miles that they typically go for some of the species. Um, but we are not aware of any hibernacula within the park. And I would love to find out where they are, but currently we don't know. Interesting. Um, next couple of questions, not too many more, and then we'll call it a wrap, but we have some interesting things. Is there a specific time of year that's the best time to put up a bat box to improve the chances of getting it used? And just tying in a little bit, um, somebody asked if they roost under bridges. Yes, bats can roost under bridges. There is a famous bat roost in Texas where people go to view the bats emerge and there's hundreds of thousands of them. It's crazy, amazing, and I, I really wanna go one day. Um, yes, they do roost under bridges. Um, within the park, I, I'm not 100% sure if we have any that roost on the bridges. That would be something that we, we should look into. It would be interesting to know, um, but not that I know of in our area. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, what's the best time to put up the bat box? Yes, um, so bat boxes, I would say early spring before they come back. Um, you know, there are, there's a lot that goes into putting up a bat box and it's not a 100% um, you're gonna get a bat in it if you put it up. Um, with that link that I provided, it's gonna give you great information about how to put it up, which way to orient it, and even what color to put, because um, different colors in different regions based on the uh, exposure to sunlight. So I would say, I would say early spring before they um, come back. So from their um, hibernacula when they when they are going to find their maternity roost, especially if trees have been cut down over the winter or have fallen down um, after autumn. And if you've done any maintenance to your house where you might have sealed something up, putting a new roof on. So I would say early spring. So you give them that opportunity to have additional roosting areas. Jessica, Great. do you have anything to add? Maybe she doesn't. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Bats don't appear to have hands. Can they grab things? So um, they will actually use their tail area to grab their food. If you recall in that one video that I had of the echolocation, they kind of swoop in over their food and will um, use their tail and they'll just like kind of bucket it into their mouth. Um, they can use their hands when they're crawling. Um, I don't typically 
think that they would use it for anything else. Um, Jessica, do you have any input on that? They mostly use their feet to cling on to things, especially when they're roosting upside down. Interesting. Right. I think we have the, sorry, Jessica, didn't mean to jump in. Did you have anything else to add? Because then we have a couple of questions left and we're going to call it a wrap and turn it back to Michael. Uh, I, I was going to kind of agree. I mean, they'll use that. There's like a thumb kind of ish thing at the top of their wing that they sometimes will use to like get, keep a thing in front of their face while they eat it. But it's not the same as we think of as like a real hand. Yeah, they probably use their um, fingers to more so like broom themselves and like cover up at night. They cover up with their wings. So great. And can we volunteer for an ABC count in the Delaware? So this one I will leave up to Jessica because this is my last season very likely at the park. Um, we don't like to typically say where our roosting sites are just, um, just to keep them safe. But if there are any opportunities, I'm sure Jessica um, can chime in here and let you guys know. I would say yes. Um, we can actually provide um, a website too in here for, it's especially with the Appalachian back count just because it is it's largely, I think, Pennsylvania. I don't know that New York has the same, they're, I assume they follow probably the same protocols. Um, but if you know you have bats on your property or somewhere where you know you can count bats, like absolutely. Yeah, and it would be really great if you can reach out to us if you have a large roost in your attic or if you know of an area that has a large roost because we would love to know where the bats are in our park. Great. and do. What is the flying range? So that will be depend on species. Um, it also depends on if they're going out at the end of the night to feed or if you're talking about migration. So I know the little brown bat will typically stay within like a short migration distance, um, around 500 miles. And, you know, some of our hybrid, our, our uh, migrating bats that migrate south will fly a lot of miles. <laughs> Um, but to feed at the end of the night, I would say they don't go too, too, too far from the roost, but they can definitely travel a bit. Jessica, do you have any input on that one? Yeah, so some of our bats, like the hoary bats, uh, which are the tree bats, they will actually fly um, all the way south to Central America. Um, and then some of our bats are, yes, they're more inclined to stay locally and not travel so far. Um, yes. So. It, and like Eric said, if it's a feeding night, then they, and because oftentimes, especially if it's a large roost, um, it, it's really just, they have such a high metabol metabolism that they eat for a little while, and then they sleep for a little while to process it, and then they go eat for a little while, and then they sleep again. And so they're actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, the second animal to sleep the longest during the day is cats. Huh. Wow. Interesting, and this will be the last question, and then we're going to flip it back over to Michael to wrap up the show. Um, in terms of the white nose syndrome, what agencies are investigating it, and is there any type of cure, and how much of a priority is that? So um, we have the Pennsylvania Game Commission that is definitely one of our local agencies and New York DEC. Um, they are both researching and they'll go into the hibernacula um, and you know try to get estimations of the populations, but try to minimally uh, dis not disturb them. Um, and they do the treatments of the fungicide before the bats come in. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if there's any treatment that they can apply directly to the bats at this time. There is no cure for white nose syndrome, unfortunately. Well, thank you so much, Erica and Jessica. Just to follow up again, there are a number of both private texts or chats, whatever we call it these days, on the app and a number of people just saying questions. Thank you so much for an enlightening and informative presentation. And on that note, we are going back to Michael Drillinger in about two seconds. Michael, you're muted. Maybe three seconds. <laughs> no sweat. 
the Joker got in the way. Right. And I'm not even on the slide that I wanted to be on. Look at that. How prepared am I? Anyway, okay, here we go. So um, the Ten Mile River Museum would like to extend our deep appreciation to Erica Spies and Jessica Newburn uh, for this wonderful program. I certainly enjoyed it. Um, I actually have been to Austin, Texas and have watched the bats come out of the bridge at sunset and it is a totally awesome sight. Um, I want to remind uh, everybody that even though the museum is closed, you can take a virtual tour of the TMR Museum at, the, at our website at uh, tmrmuseum.org slash historian. Scouts can actually earn the 2020 No COVID Historian patch by watching the video, uh, watching the virtual tour and answering some questions. Everybody is more than welcome to visit the museum's online store. If you're interested, we're offering this six inch back patch that uh, commemorates this very unusual year, almost the, uh, in, in, in almost a 100 year history, this is the first summer that 10 Mile River is not open for scout camping. And uh, the patch commemorates this year and says that we're all in this together. I would like to invite everybody to join us uh, a week from tonight where our presenter will be Lauren Epstein, who will be talking about uncovering unconscious bias. And one more time, if you enjoyed this program and uh, it's motivated you to support future programs like this, please visit tmrmuseum.org slash donate. And again, to interact with the museum online, we have our website, our Facebook, our Twitter account, and our YouTube channel. Again, I want to thank the National Park Service and especially Erica and Jessica for a wonderful program tonight. And I wish everybody a good evening.